My name is Jason Stibbs. I'm a part of the Phoenix Core team. I'm a partner at Rock and Cat. Um, one of my small claims to fame is many years ago I wrote the plug logger um, and I added the microsecond symbol uh, to the log. So every time you see that, uh, think about my face. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to talk today a little bit about WebRTC and I want to start off with a small question. Um, so raise your hand if you've used video calling like Google Hangouts or Peer.in or Slack before. Uh, great, pretty much everyone. And then how many of you were having a meeting and you had to disable the video because the connection sucked or the quality sucked and it was distracting? Right, so uh, pretty much everyone raised their hands. Um, I had the same exact problem. Uh, so I created a project called Team Chat, um, which was kind of there for me to learn WebRTC. Um, and basically it's a website you go to, um, you give it a name, um, and then you get a URL. Um, and you can share that URL with anyone, and as long as they have a supported browser, um, they can instantly talk with you. Just, just voice communications, no video, doesn't try to do any you know, uh, shenanigans, it just does voice, so it's really quick. Um, and you know, I learned a lot about WebRTC in this process, and I wanted to kind of share my experiences um, about this really cool technology that we all have in our browsers that uh, none of us really use outside of the video and audio context. Um, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about what is WebRTC, how you might use it. Um, I'm gonna go through a small technical demo. Um, then I'm gonna get into some of the technical bits and some of the things I'd like to see in the future. Um, so WebRTC is, um, at its basis, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer framework um, in your browser. Um, it's the only way for two browsers to directly communicate with each other. Um, there's no middle server. Um, we, when WebRTC was first designed, it was designed specifically for connecting one browser to another browser. Um, but it's not just a browser, um, there's also mobile devices and there's even serverless implementations. Um, so for example, um, we use Apple FaceTime, uh, that uses the WebRTC protocol. Um, and now the latest versions of Skype and everything use WebRTC as well. Um, and a lot of people think, um, when they hear WebRTC, they think it's only web, uh, video and audio, and that's really great because your browser will handle encoding, it'll handle decoding, um, it'll handle bitrate, um, it'll figure out what the optimal resolution is to send over the wire automatically for you. Um, but when Google was making uh, the first version of WebRTC so that they could support Google Hangouts, um, they also snuck in the data channel. So um, basically in our browsers we have a way to build and deploy peer-to-peer uh, -peer applications um, that can communicate directly between two browsers um, very easily. Um, and it's, like I said, the only way to send peer-to-peer -peer data between two browsers um, without a middle person. Um, and it also happens to be the easiest way currently today to deploy a peer-to-peer -peer application. Um, if you think about peer-to-peer -peer applications that you know, we use today, like BitTorrent or like Napster or Kaza or something, you have to download a client onto your local machine, you have to run it, you have to open all these ports, um, you have to figure out how to use it. Um, but with a browser, you just have to go to a website and it works. Um, the, the connections are automatically encrypted for you by default. You can't have an unencrypted WebRTC connection. Um, so when you talk, with a Google Hangout or a peer.in or something, um, it's fully encrypted. You don't have to really think about it. The browser handles it for you. Um, and you know, between two browsers, a uh, direct connection is always gonna have the best possible latency. Um, and that's kind of alluding to the, uh, title, the subtitle when I talk about microseconds. Um, you're never gonna have a better connection between two browsers than a direct connection on a LAN or you know, even on you know, the same building. You're always gonna have a better time than going up to a server and back. Um, so that, like that's WebRTC, um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer application. And you know, when you're developing a peer-to-peer -peer application, you have like kind of three fundamental things you have to figure out um, before you can build it and you know, while you build it. Um, and the first one is kind of like peer discovery. So it's basically who do you connect to and who has the data that I want. Um, if you think about Skype or Hangouts, um, you have a user list that you, you, know, you sign up and you create an account and it's got a list of users you can talk to and you can communicate with. Um, and then once you know, the connection's made, it's handled peer-to-peer, -peer, right? When you talk on a Skype call, you're making a direct connection to another user in their application, usually. Um, with BitTorrent, um, a very famous peer-to-peer -peer application, you, there is a tracker, which is a central server that has sort of a bootstrap list of peers that you can connect to to kind of to get the rest of the data, to get the rest of the peers. Um, and then there's uh, sort of like services like Kaza and Napster use a distributed hash table where you'd have, you start off with a single peer, and because you can talk to that one peer, you can find out uh, where any data is in the entire network. Um, when you're building a WebRTC application, we really only have one uh, solution right now, which is sort of a central server like Hangouts and Skype. Um, because it lives in a the browser, there's certain limitations about what we can connect to and what we can talk to. Um, but it's not really a limitation, it's a very small limitation. Um, 
you still need a central server, and that's kind of where, in our case, where Phoenix and Elixir will come in um, down the line. Um, the second problem is opening and maintaining a connection is kind of hard, um, especially for in a peer-to-peer -peer context. Um, for like right now, we're all in a network uh, with a router, and it's got certain restrictions on what ports it has open, who can make connections to who, um, what your bandwidth is. Um, and, and in the corporate environment, you have a lot of situations with you know, NATs and VPNs um, and all kinds of weird rules with firewalls. Um, Luckily, in our case, the browser attempts to handle all of this for you, um, and we'll go over that in a bit. Um, and then maintaining the connection, right? When you're um, you know, in this conference, you're probably moving from router to router as you switch rooms. Um, when you use your cell phone, you're moving between um, from Wi-Fi networks to LTE networks, and then you may even be changing um, towers as you use your network. Um, in our case, again, the browser attempts to handle all of this for you. Um, and then the third problem is like, you know, what is my application domain, and like, how do we connect to each other? Um, so here's an example of one peer-to-peer -peer application where two peers are directly communicating, and that's basically the whole topology. Um, this is an, this, oh, I think my thing disconnected. My bad. I hope. Uh, yeah, so this is the case like a Skype call or a, you know, a direct phone call. Each user is talking directly to each other. Um, you could have a mesh topology or many-to-many. -many. Um, this is what I used in team chat. Um, where each user maintains another connection to every other user. Um, an application like a peer.in also does this. Um, in the context of a browser, when you're doing, especially when you're doing video and audio, you can about handle six peers. Um, and that's because um, with each user, you have to encode the video and send it. And then when they send their video to you, you have to decode it and display it. Um, and you have to do this once for each user. Um, so for, in, for the user case, if they have a bad connection or a bad internet uh, source or low bandwidth or bandwidth caps, you may not want to ship an app like this because um, they're doing three times the work that they would have to do unless there's a central server. Um, I did it for team chat just because it was simple and I was learning what peer-to-peer -peer is. Um, and you know, it's great if you're all in the same building or in the same geographic area because you get really low latency. Um, but like I said, browsers can handle up to six. If you do data channels, you can probably get a lot more. Um, but with audio and video, six is, seems to be the, everyone agrees that's the one where the Chrome crashes. Um, you could do star topologies, or one to many, where you know, one user is kind of like the broadcaster, and everyone just kind of communicates with them. Um, you can imagine sort of a Twitch streaming or like a webinar service where the green user's you know, presenting to all the users. You could also imagine a situation where uh, the green person is accepting streams from everyone, and then they're rebroadcasting it out. Um, to all the other users. Um, this is something you have to decide, and it's based purely on your application domain again. Um, we'll talk about this one a little bit later in some future uses. Um, and then finally, um, with WebRTC, uh, there is a centralized uh, approach where each user communicates with a central server, um, and you know, that central server either acts as sort of a proxy and bounces the messages between green and red, you know, from green to red and red to green and red to blue or whatever or it will do some sort of aggregation like merging video streams and audio streams and then sending only one stream down. Um, unfortunately, right now, because of the limits of WebRTC and the limits of networks in general, and because you know, the people who are doing it are like big Google and Apple, uh, they do a lot of things like this. Um, a lot of the services are built like this because um, you get certain, um, you get guarantees that a user is gonna be able to connect to it and um, you, like I said, you can do transformations and you can keep track, you can keep the video around. So like if you're at Google, maybe you want to keep the streams around so that they can be replayed later. Um, so in Google Hangouts case, they do this. Um, so yeah, I, I've been listing off a bunch of apps that are using it in the real world. Uh, right now it's a lot of big, sort of big players. Uh, Google Hangouts was the first one. Uh, they're the reason we have WebRTC because they wanted to make Skype in the browser. They wrote their own plugin and then they said, hey, let's make this a spec. Um, so then Firefox and then fought forever and they're still fighting about the spec, but uh, Peer.in is a good example. Uh, Slack recently had calls to their platform. They use WebRTC. Um, Apple FaceTime is a weird example. They use, they use WebRTC as a protocol for the video and audio transmission, but um, as you'll see in a bit, they don't support it in the browser at all. Uh, the newest version of Skype uses WebRTC. They just started supporting it. On my project, and then there's uh, WebTorrent, which is a really cool example. It's a fully functioning WebTorrent client in your browser. It connects. Um, there's some magic that happens in the tracker side, but it will connect to actual BitTorrent clients out there. You can fully stream, upload, and download torrents in the browser. Um, it's a really cool example of WebRTC, and if you're interested, you should really check it out because it's, they're doing some of the coolest things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and rip off the Band-Aid right away. Um, it's pretty well supported. Um, 
you can see that the, the usual player support it, Chrome and Firefox. Um, Internet Explorer uh, actually supports it in the latest version. Um, they support everything but data channels for some reason, and then they invented their own, you can see right here, their own spec called ORTC, which is almost WebRTC, but it's a little different. Um, and slowly but surely, WebRTC and ORTC will merge into one spec. It's supposed to be the next version of WebRTC or something, but um, the big uh, elephant in the room is Safari, not supporting it at all. Um, once they support it, WebRTC will pretty much be like 100% ready. It'll be, everyone should be able to use it and deploy apps confidently. They were supposed to be hiring a WebRTC person last year, um, but I, we don't know what happened of it. it. It wasn't a part of the Mac OS Sierra beta and everything, but so that's kind of the downer. Safari doesn't support it, but everyone else supports it, and it's, a, it's an official spec now, so everyone's going to support it. Um, they even decided on audio and video and codecs that they're going to support and fallback codecs that they'll support, so no more, no more fighting or anything. Um, and then this is a list of features. Um, if you're interested in learning about when it's going to be ready, there's a website, is webrtcreadyyet.com, lists off all the features about WebRTC and what you can use in a web browser. Um, so let's talk through a really small example. Um, uh, here we have an example where I'm trying to design a WebRTC calling app, where I have the green user wants to talk directly with the red user. The red user. Um, so we need to have a central server to surge up, surf up the HTTP. Um, and in my case, it's a, it's a Phoenix web application um, where green and red are communicating with Phoenix. Uh, I'm using phoenix.presence. Um, so yeah, this, is, this kind of emulates what my demo is going to be. So you know, kind of keep this in your brain. But we're using phoenix.presence to know that green and red are online and available to talk. Um, green says, you know, hey, I want to talk to red. Um, so it, it creates an offer um, and then tells, asks Phoenix to give it to red. Um, and what is the offer? Um, the offer is uh, a little packet of data that your browser generates. Um, and basically it says, you know, this is what my browser is capable of doing. It says, you know, I can speak this audio encoding, I can speak this video encoding. Um, I, I, want, I want to send it at this resolution at this bit rate. Um, this is the encryption I want to use. Um, this is the protocol I'd like to speak. Uh, when you're using data channels, you know, it sets up all the data channels that you want to set up. You can set up as many data channels as you want and it'll multiplex it for you. Um, and then finally, it, you know, it says, you know, this is what I think my IP address is and how I think you can connect to me. Um, and the browser handles all this for you. Um, it, there's a spec that you can review if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, but you just say, hey, browser, give me you know, an offer so I can, I can send it to the other user, um, and then it works. Um, so yeah, back to our example. Uh, Phoenix you know, routes the, the offer to Red. Uh, Red says, oh, hey, great, here's my offer. And then Phoenix routes it back. So now green and red know about each other, what they can do and how they connect to each other. Um, they make a connection. Again, the browser handles all that for you. Um, and then Phoenix can kind of get out of the picture. Um, and this whole process um, is called signaling. Um, and in, in my case, I'm trying to make a strong argument that uh, Phoenix.Presence and you know, Phoenix channels are really, really great for signaling. Um, and I think Erlang is really great for it as well. Because if you kind of think about what Erlang was first invented for is invented for routing phone calls. Um, and that's essentially what this process is, signaling. Um, it's how do I connect to someone? In the case of a phone call, you have a phone number and you say, I want to talk to user, you know, 1-800, whatever. Um, and then Erlang figures out how to route that phone call to the other user and then it makes a connection. Um, in our case, you know, it's whatever your application is. You know, it's I want to talk to, you know, this user with this username. You know, Phoenix figure it out. Um, Phoenix.Presence manages that for you. It manages a list of who's online, um, what their ID is, what the devices they're connected to, so maybe you want to make the call to their mobile device instead of their actual browser. Phoenix.Presence can handle all that for you. Um, but you don't have to use Phoenix.Presence. Um, there's tons, of, uh, tons and tons of signaling uh, services out there. Um, a lot of people use SIP or Jingle. You can use IRC or even Slack, XMPP or even Ajax. Basically any way you can share small JSON payload. So there's some examples online where you copy and paste the JSON object and you send it to them via email or something, and then they send you their offer back. Um, but this is the process of signaling, and um, that's like basically it. Once you've got the, the two browsers have the offer, um, real-time communications can happen without Phoenix needing to be around at all. Um, it's basically a you know, three-step process. Create an offer, get the offer to the other person, and you guys can talk. Um, and that's, like, that's the absolute high level. That's all you have to do to make WebRTC work in your browser. Um, in my demo, in a bit, right after this, um, I'm going to be using a library called SimplePeer. Um, every browser right now has a slightly different API. 
it, it kind of sucks. Um, and Simple Peer just kind of extracts the API into an easy to use uh, system. Um, I like to think of it as kind of like the jQuery.ajax of WebRTC right now. Um, the same person who wrote uh, WebTorrent.js and he also wrote uh, a CDN based on WebRTC where if you visit the website, it, it'll, it'll serve up the JavaScript for you know, everyone on the same land as you from your computer. Um, he, he created Simple Peer um, and it's really great. So you should use it. So let's do, let's do a small demo. Um, so um, I ba basically what I built is a uh, chat roulette for ElixirConf. Um, and basically, you have a website here, you come to the website and you're put in the waiting queue, um, and then someone shows up. I have a plant in the audience, Nick. Um, our network's not super great, apparently. You can see super high latency, but, um, and then you guys are instantly streaming. Um, and then if you know, Nick leaves and someone else joins, I would be instantly reconnected with them. Um, so yeah, this is phoenix-webrtc.herokuapp.com. Um, you can see it if you'd like. But it's a really simple example of um, how to use WebRTC. Um, so I'm going to close this just in case someone else comes. And then, <laughs> yeah, try not to do lewd things. This isn't chat roulette. Um, but so here's the, here's the, uh, the first bit of Elixir code. I'm going to start with Elixir because it's a lot easier um, to follow. Um, here we have sort of the user lobby, and this is where you, you get immediately entered into when you join the website. Um, we track the user's presence, um, you know, just using Phoenix presence. Um, and then I grab the whole list of users, I filter out myself, um, and then I grab the first user. If that user exists, then I tell them to start a call. Um, and then I give them sort of a room to join so that they can send their offers privately to each other. Um, and that's this room over here. Um, it's basically it joins. I do a little authentication here. Um, and then I track that they're, you know, they're in the room. I don't really need to do this in this case. But, um, and then the browser can send up an event called Signal that I just broadcast to all the users in the room, which is only two, um, with the payload. Um, so yeah, Phoenix, like I said, Phoenix makes this almost trivial to set up. Um, in Node.js, they have a socket.io peer-to-peer that you have to set up, and it, you basically have almost the exact same amount of code, but you need to have a, another library to make it possible. Um, in terms of the JavaScript side, um, it's about 80 lines of code total. Um, it's just ES6. I'm sorry I didn't use React or uh, TypeScript or something, um, but really simple uh, example here. You join the channel. I check to see if you have you know, WebRTC support, um, and this is from peer.js. Whenever you see peer, it's for peer.js. Um, I join the user lobby. Um, you listen for the chat start message. If you get the chat start message, check to see if you're in it. Um, this is kind of a hack I did because I didn't really want to write a whole system. I just wanted a really easy example. Um, if you're in it, then you, know, you leave the user lobby so that you're not re-queued up with someone else. Um, you join the call room, and then uh, I grab the video. This get user media is the function you use to grab video and audio from the browser. Um, do some error handling, JavaScript stuff. I add your video to the, to the page, uh, and then I play it. And then here I create the WebRTC peer. Um, I pass the stream to it. Um, I have some other config options, like ICE servers, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and then you have to tell it which is, who's the initiator. So in this case, it would be red. The red user is the initiator. Um, scroll past some of this error handling that I having a branch elsewhere, fixed elsewhere. Um, but then here, here's kind of like, this code right here is all you need to do to handle WebRTC. Um, it's five lines of code. Um, you ask your browser for an offer, um, and it's an asynchronous process, and it gives you your offer. I send it down the channel, and then on the other user, they'll receive the signal from the other user, and they accept it. Um, and then, you know, we just wait for a connection to be made. We wait for the user stream to be sent to us, and we add it to a video element, and we play it. Um, if we were doing a data channel, we would just have peer on data, and whenever a user sent data down the pipe, we'd have a callback to handle it. Um, and you know, it's peer push to push data down the pipe. We can push arbitrary JSON. You can also push binaries and stuff down the pipe. Um, but like, this is all you need to do to make a fully, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer application in your browser. Um, so let's get back to the presentation. Um, so yeah, that code, that website's uh, phoenix hobartcom um, the code is open source, so if you want to, if I went too fast and you want to take a look or copy and paste it for your project, go nuts. Um, it's right there. Um, I want to, so here's just an example code. I want to talk about it a little bit. Sorry, it's a little washed out, uh, but I mentioned that the the signal was asynchronous, um, and it's asynchronous because the hardest part about generating an offer isn't figuring out what your browser is capable of doing, but it's figuring out what your IP address is, um, and. Because you exist in a pub, you know, usually a private network or a private router, 
Um, your browser has a hard time knowing what its IP address is. Um, so they devised this, a protocol called STUN or ICE. Um, and you'll see this all the time. You know, it's always in all caps. That's why it's in all caps here. Um, but it's a protocol basically where it's a third-party server that's running you know, on the internet somewhere, public internet with a public IP address that you know, um, where your, your browser says, you, know, you ask it to make an offer, and then your browser goes to the ICE server and says, hey, you know, what do you think my IP address is? And they have this, you know, this back and forth communication um, until they figure out what your public IP address is. And once they figure that out, you get an offer, um, and then you send it off. Um, whenever you're waiting in Google Hangouts for a call to like start and you see a little loading screen or like in Slack you see a little loader, you can see the person's online and trying to make a call and you just see a little a spinner. Um, it's basically your browser trying to figure out what your IP address is. Um, there is a way to make this faster and it's called Trickle Ice. Um, the Ice protocol is basically just a back and forth. Like I said, they try up to 12 times to figure out, you know, make the tra basically the trace route hops all the way from the Trickle server to your IP address until it figures out what it thinks it is. Um, with Trickle Ice, uh, you get each one of those IP addresses, and you, you, the, your first offer has, um, you know, the dumb guess that your browser makes, and it has all the, you know, the, the, the encoding and encryption stuff that you send off to them. But then the next few offers are just IP addresses that your browser can try. Um, and this, this drastically will speed up your, um, your uh, connection times, and that's what I did in TeamChat. That's why it's so much faster. Um, but if you see Sun or Ice or Trickle Ice, um, you know, it's just a configuration option. It was, like I said, you saw me set up the peer. There's an ICE servers option. I gave it a URL for a public uh, trickle server and it was set up. Um, in the case when you cannot figure out what your public IP address is, when you cannot make a connection happen because for whatever reason your network sucks, um, uh, there's, you can set up a turn server. Um, and a turn server acts like a proxy. Basically, it's a public server. Um, when red and green are trying to talk, Instead of talking directly, they talk to the, to the turn server. It will forward off all packets to the red server, and the same thing with red. Red will send packets to the turn server, and it will forward it off to the green user. Um, this is generally OK because your connection is by default encrypted, um, and because you know, your offer goes through a secure channel, you know, your secure signaling process, you don't really have to worry about um, anyone knowing what your keys are or anything. Um, some services, for instance, Slack, Slack calls enforce this, this behavior to happen. Um, and in their case, their application domain is business users who are by default behind a weird firewall or weird NAT. Um, so by forcing a turn server, it makes sure that connections happen really quick. Um, and then they, they can also uh, kind of guarantee what the latency is going to be because they can put servers near their users. Um, in, in terms of this, you can host your own Stunner ICE server. Um, there's a Erlang one uh, built by Process One called Stun. It does turn and ice. I don't think it does trickle ice, but um, it's a possibility. Um, there's also services like Twilio. Um, I'm a big fan of these services because, um, especially with Turn, you want to be as close as possible to your users. You don't want um, to have your, you know, your Turn server hosted in the West Coast and then have users in Ireland trying to talk, you know, through the Turn server, having the round trip latency of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so Twilio has a geolocated service, you know, globally geolocated, and it's like pennies, uh, pennies for data. Um, it's not really that expensive. Um, but yeah, so we kind of talked about WebRTC at high level. I would like to talk a little bit about like the low level aspects of WebRTC, um, some of the cooler things um, that get me excited about WebRTC, um, and the protocol underneath it, so some of the more technical bits. Um, so WebRTC is built on top of a protocol called Stream Control Transmission Protocol, or SCTP. Um, it was invented in the late 90s, um, and it was fully ratified as a spec in the early 2000s. Um, it's a protocol that's designed to be built just like U UDP or TCP. Um, it's, it it kind of lines up in the middle between SCTP, or TCP and UDP a little bit. Um, the problems are it's not supported at all by operating systems or uh, networks, pretty much, or firewalls. Um, like Amazon, like, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? A router, a system admin sets up a router, and, it, and like, they're going to accept UDP and TCP because who the hell would use a different protocol? Right? It's, they're just going to block everything else because of security risk. Um, so telecoms are pretty much the only ones that use this by default in their own networks. Um, it was built for to be a message-based, multi-homing, multi-streaming protocol. Um, so you can get some of the benefits of um, UDP without um, sacrificing some of the benefits of TCP. It also has, like, say, so yeah, I'll show this list. Basically, um, here's how it kind of lines up 
with TCP and UDP. Um, you get, so like with TCP, like basically the protocol when we do WebSockets at HTTP, you have, you know, a fully reliable, reliable and ordered um, protocol and you get flow control and congestion control by default. Um, when you think about UDP, it's fully unreliable and unordered and it's message oriented, right? So that's typically used, like in example, BitTorrent uses UDP because um, they just want to send as many packets down the pipe as possible and, you know, they have their own resolution process of a packet to get dropped or something, they can re-request it. Um, but SCTP is kind of like sort of the middle ground, where you get to decide if reliability or, or, or order is important to you, um, but you also get the message-oriented aspect of it. So you can send multiple streams, you know, because you're sending, because in TCP it's byte-oriented, you just send as many bytes down as you can and then they have to read it. Um, with UDP, you send a message down the pipe and then you can send multiple messages down the pipe for different streams. Um, and then the protocol kind of reroutes them to the correct spot. Um, at SCTP, you also get flow control and congestion control by default. Um, and with the data channel, this is really kind of cool because you get to configure this. Um, you get to decide if you want it to be ordered or reliable. You get to decide what your application needs. Um, and, you know, in terms of the browser, this is kind of unique because up until now, we, we just got, got what we got and we just had to use it, right? So we had Ajax which is you know, a TCP connection that you make with HTTP, um, and it's pretty good for most cases. And then you have WebSockets that are a little bit faster because we have one connection open and we're not sending headers back and forth, but um, it's kind of limited to what TCP can do. Um, in, the tr in the data channel where your WebRTC, you get to decide you know, I, if, you want, you know, if you want completely unordered and almost you know, partially reliable, you can decide that, right? You can basically get the semantics of UDP in the browser. Um, and this is what WebTorrent does, right? They, they, they say, I want it to act like UDP so I can get as much data in and out as possible without, um, without having to do round trip acts and all that stuff that you have with TCP. Um, so yeah, these are all the different things you can, you can configure, all the different options um, when you initialize your data channel. Um, some of the neat ones I think are kind of like the, the timeout based reliability or, or uh, you know, retransmit of a, of a packet. Um, so if you kind of think about like um, high speed trading or audio or video, uh, you, you might want to set up a timeout for your packets where, you know, I only care about what happened in the last five milliseconds in, in an audio conversation, right? I don't care if something happened, you know, 30 seconds ago, right? If a packet got dropped, it got dropped, I don't care about it. Um, you can configure that. I mean, the same with like high-speed trading, right? You may not care about the, you know, the, the trades that happened minutes ago. You only really care about now because you can only really process now fast enough. Um, so you get to configure all of that inside of a, um, inside of your data channel. Um, which I think is super neat, right? Inside your browser, you have the option to, you know, write applications <laughs> in like you couldn't do before. Um, so let's talk about uh, the future of what I think is really neat about WebRTC and that, that, are, that are coming and that you can do today. Um, if I talk about like a, a, a browser spec, just assume Chrome and Firefox support it and nobody else right now, but in the future, everyone will support it. Um, so right away, uh, one of the neat things is uh, web audio support which is you can take a stream from another user. Um, if you saw uh, Josh Adams talk today about web audio where you know, they, were, they were editing or creating audio on the, on the fly, um, you could take a bunch of streams from a, a, a voice call or a video call and you can merge them, you can apply effects to them, you could um, do fast Fourier transforms on them. Um, basically anything you can do with a web audio stream you can do with a WebRTC stream. Um, a neat, one neat idea is you could you know, do a real-time authentication. So you're talking to someone, you know, with a voice chat, and they could analyze their voice to make sure they, they are who they say they are. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, oh, you could also do like, you know, is this person talking, and you could show waveforms, and you can do all kinds of weird stuff um, with streams. Another neat thing is you can do screen sharing, so you can grab any window on your computer and share it. So you could very easily, you know, with that five lines of code, you could share, um, you could create your own screen hero, or you could create your own uh, webinar application. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty neat one. Uh, so then there's a consist of uh, stream rebroadcasting. Um, and this kind of goes into that sort of star topology, right? This allows you to do some really weird um, topologies in the browser that you couldn't do before. Um, and if you could imagine, you know, kind of like a network like this where the green users may be like a famous Twitch streamer or a YouTube streamer, um, and they want to live broadcast to all their users, but they're sick and tired of paying Twitch, you know, the, you know whatever, they have to pay Twitch. Um, so the green user broadcasts the red, blue, and brown, and then, you know, this green user shows up and says, hey, I want to I view it, so they stream from red, and then red just rebroadcasts the stream to green. 
Um, so everyone in the network is sharing the cost of the bandwidth. You don't, you don't need to have centralized servers like you know, Twitch or YouTube where um, Google pays the cost of streaming all of that, both the upload and the download. In this case, everyone's just sharing it. Um, and again, you'd have to figure out how to maintain this state. Um, you'd have to figure out how to route people to the right spot. Um, and there are, if you search for uh, WebRTC um, stream rebroadcasting, there are some libraries where they attempt to do this. Um, you still get really bad, I mean, so the further you get away from them, you get bad latency, right? Um, the, the worse your latency gets because each person has to rebroadcast it, upload and download it. Um, but that's kind of neat, right? You can do those kind of things now. Um, there's full Canvas support. So if you'd like to take the video, put it into Canvas, draw weird hats and Snapchat filters all over the face and process it, you can totally do that today in real time. You can also do the opposite where you take a Canvas, draw on it, and then send it down the pipe and stream it to other users. Um, you can imagine, you know, with WebRTC support using the data channel, you could imagine making a game with the Canvas and the data channel where, you know, it's a multiplayer game and you're talking back and forth, is, you know, with lowest possible latency. Um, and this final idea is kind of like, I'm kind of hoping it kind of brings home, um, brings it home to the ElixirConf. Um, and I think it would be really neat to see a, a, a library like Gen WebRTC, um, where the client can connect directly to Erlang as if it's a peer. Um, and some of the neat things, uh, you get all the neat characteristics of SCTP, right, where you can control the latency and the reliability. Um, so, for example, if you're making a game and WebSockets have too high of latency because of the round trip hack, you could use, you know, GenWebRTC to communicate directly with the server, and which, which, which obviously leads into um, allowing us to use the abstractions we have in Phoenix um, with channels. So, like, you could use Phoenix.channels by simply, by developing a Phoenix.transforms.webRTC, um, you could develop, you could use your same channels and the same code we use today um, to communicate between a browser and a server. Um, and this is super neat, right? This is a technology all of us have in our computers today, um, but it allows us to build, you know, higher performance applications in the context of a browser, whereas previously we were limited to whatever WebSocket can support. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's my talk. Um, if you want to learn more about WebRTC, uh, this first website, hpbn.co, um, High Performance Browser Networking, it's an O'Reilly book that was open sourced um, and it's made free online. They talk about HTTP and WebSockets and performance. Um, and it's, it's pretty much the, right now the best spot for documentation for WebRTC online. Um, all the different browsers support different APIs right now, but this one kind of goes over everything. It's really great. Um, there's WebRTC.org, which is Google's website. Um, and then there's WebRTC Hacks, which is sort of like a blog of you know, when Slack released their call features, you know, someone looked in to internals and saw what they're doing. And, you know, you can kind of keep up to date with who supports WebRTC and what they're doing with it. Um, it's kind of neat to see how industry is using it and like how they're getting around some limitations and things. Um, but you know, I want to have one more slide. Um, we're all professional engineers here. I got to say it. Um, you know, HTTP and WebSockets are great. <laughs> For most use cases, I wouldn't suggest rewriting your application to use WebRTC. Um, it's not super well supported by Safari and other browsers, um, and when you're making a WebRTC app, you're making a peer-to-peer -peer application, which means it's going to be harder to debug. It's going to be slower in some cases. It's going to be faster in some cases. And you're going to get a lot of weird bugs, um, which if that's what your application is all about, that's great. Use WebRTC. It's amazing. Um, but don't go out and rewrite your application in WebRTC. Um, so I'm Jason Sibbs. Um, I'm Peregrine on Twitter. My GitHub is Jerrigrin. Um, I'm a co-founder of Rockin' Cat. We do a lot of lecture coaching, consulting, and development. Um, and other stuff, we make mobile apps and stuff. So um, if you're interested in working with me or on WebRTC or Elixir stuff, let me know. Um, if you have any questions about this, uh, I think we have time for some questions still. I don't, yeah, probably. Uh, so just find the person with the mic right there, yep. And I'll answer any questions you have. Hey, Jason, uh, thanks Hi. for a re really great talk. And um, what you were talking about with Phoenix Transport, that's mm -hmm. exactly what I've just spent the last month or six weeks looking into. So, cool. Um, we should I've talk. I've also started a Slack channel, WebRTC Slack channel. I don't know whether you knew about it, but um, Great. I'd love to work with you and try and make that happen. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you after. Thanks. Great. So we might have it. It'd be cool. Got a question here? So, have you? Uh, what's what's the deal with Gen SCTP in Erlang? 
Have you used that? So yeah, thanks for asking. I forgot to mention that. Um, OTP has GenSATP built into it. Um, I looked at the commit logs and the mailing list. It was started but never finished. So it has some tests that don't run or pass, and it's in there, but it doesn't work. Um, if you were to ma make this, we'd also have to develop, obviously, uh, uh, I think we'd have to make Gen T DTLS so that we can do the encryption on top of UDP. Um, and then we'd have to make uh, an SDP parser, which is sort of the, the format for the offer. Um, so there's a couple libraries that would have to get written to make it possible. W once those are written, you know, it's, it's on, it's open. So, and I know there's some C++ libraries and stuff, so like if we wanted to build it with a NIF or something, um, we could probably do that. But, you know, that's kind of that's lame. I don't know if you mentioned it, but mobile browsers? Oh, yeah, so mobile browsers right now, no support across the board. Um, but there are mobile libraries. Um, so, for example, Slack calls. There's Google WebRTC. Well, I guess, okay, sorry. Google Chrome on the latest version of Android will support WebRTC. That's it. Um, there are libraries for WebRTC. Uh, the C++ libraries that people have compiled on Android and iOS. So if you want to make an app that supports it, it's very simple. Uh, you just have to follow the instructions, and then you get the JavaScript library. Um, more questions? Cool. Thanks, guys.